Hey guys, it's Sarah from Just My Typewriter, and today is the finale of my Buying a Bad Typewriter series. As you can see here, I have a fully finished Royal Den, and it took me a really long time to get here. In fact, it took me a year. So let's go through a little bit of the process. Let's talk about some of the repair factors on this, and a little bit of the experience of rebuilding a typewriter from the ground up. Let's go through the timeline really quickly. I got this typewriter in about November of 2020. I found it on Facebook Marketplace. I saw the pictures and I couldn't live without it. So I had my sister go and pick it up for me in State College, which is where she was living at the time. Are you coming to visit? Can you sit? Okay, you have to stay there. In about January of 2021, I decided to tackle the most intimidating part to me, which was actually the keys of this typewriter. They were these green plastic things that you would usually see on a machine from the 1950s on a Royal, and I didn't know what was underneath them. So I did go through the process of steaming off those top keys. Turns out they were just plastic keys glued in with wood glue on top of the original key cup, but there was nothing underneath them. So I did have to go through and find some donor keys from a parts machine that I could use to inset into this typewriter. And I did that in January. While I was putting the keys back together into the key unit, I also took out the rest of the stuff inside the typewriter, which was a very daunting task. It took me a long time to figure out how to take out some of these pieces because I had no idea what I was doing. And that was in March of 2021. At the same time, I also took the frame, sanded down the outside of the frame and repainted it. And that was all done within the span of about two weeks. And I had started putting pieces back into the machine and I ran Ran into some trouble. Mostly I didn't know how things worked. And then from March 2021 until about August 2021, I didn't do anything. I was fed up with this process. I was annoyed that things didn't fit back into the machine perfectly. I was annoyed that the paint job wasn't perfect. It bothered me that things just didn't fit back in the way they came out. And I didn't know still yet what was missing on this typewriter to get it to actually function because I couldn't get it to work. And then from August till about Thanksgiving break, I was still working on putting back the pieces in this machine. And we did some adjustments as we were getting into that time as well of, okay, let's put these pieces in, let's see what they do and what we can do to make them fit like perfectly. And I realized I was still missing some parts, including a few springs, which I had to figure out how to fix or replace. I had to do the decals on some of the other panel parts. It was just taking me a really long time to figure out how these things worked. But by the power of a mechanic that I'm related to and a little bit of pixie dust, we were able to get this Royal 10 back together and it took, I swear, blood, sweat, and tears. I know I bled on this typewriter at some point because everything wants to stab you on a typewriter. This project was so intimidating. It was so lengthy. It was so frustrating. I cannot tell you how many times I've cried over this typewriter just because I wanted to do such a good job. To me, it's really important that when I get a typewriter, I do my best to make sure that I can get it back to working order and make sure that somebody's going to want it when I'm done with it. I already had a bit of a crisis of conscience when I painted this typewriter because I wasn't sure if that was the right thing to do until I finished painting it. But I knew that some of the other things that I had to tackle in this machine I wasn't really capable of yet. I didn't have a skill set to be able to do those things. And I found that really intimidating when my goal was to make sure that this machine worked when I was done with it and that somebody would want it. So a year later, here's what I came up with and I'm actually pretty happy with the result. It does not type perfectly and there are definitely still some things that could use some work on it, but it's all in one piece and it types a little bit. Here's a little bit of a type test for you. Clearly it's not the smoothest running machine out there, but I'm really excited that this project started looking like this and now it looks like this. So let's go in a little bit to some specific repairs that I did on this machine as I was putting it back together. One issue we had throughout this process was knowing how to properly adjust the typewriter. We weren't sure what had been replaced or what was original to the machine. Clearly, somebody else at some point was in here before me. 
When I replaced the key toppers, I did it as a unit, placing each key lever into the framework where I had removed the old ones. I then placed the entire unit into the keyboard area of the typewriter and linked everything back into place. There's a series of linkages here and it gets confusing really fast. Right behind the front panel of the typewriter is a bar with many slots for these little curved pieces to go. These curved pieces link the front of the key lever to another linkage piece that attaches it to a pivot point of the key in the basket. I linked these in first. The back of the key lever is held together in place with a rod that by pressing on the key, the front of the lever pulls down this linkage and pivots the pivot point lifting the key or type slug. So this key lever attaches to these little hooks which are numbered and these hooks attach to these curved pieces which are held in here. These curved pieces hold a longer piece of linkage that takes you to these standing up pieces of linkage down here and these link to the back of the type bar and then they also link to the back of the typewriter where those springs are in the back. I then linked all of these pivot point pieces, which are also held in place by a bar, and linked each of these to the curve pieces from that front panel area. Then, each of these pivot points is linked to a tight bar or slug held into the basket with an S-shaped wire linkage piece. The back of these pivot points are all attached to the tension mechanism at the back of the typewriter with a series of shepherd hook shaped pieces and springs, so I can adjust the tension of the keys by applying more or less pressure on the springs in the back of the machine. I put everything back in the machine the way it came out, which is a problem because it wasn't right in the first place. And here's where I ran into some issues. What I learned was the curved pieces at the front of the key all had these shaped patterns on them and specifically had different lengths of curves on them to fit specific rows of the keyboard. I had no idea what the right pattern was, but the wrong one meant that some keys didn't reach the pivot point and others had too much room or slop. It also led to a misalignment problem with some of these pivot points. They should all match up and align with each other, but as you can see here, mine don't. What I learned is that I had the pattern wrong of the curved pieces at the front, and that the linkages that attach the front of the key lever to these curved pieces were also wrong. It turns out that these tiny pieces had numbers on them. I had them in the wrong order and had to reorder all of them based on that number. I have solved the riddle of the Sphinx. Actually, it's just that these little bar things were numbered the whole time, and I had no idea. This also corresponds with the type slug, which is numbered, and the linkage pieces from the pivot points to the type slug, which is also numbered. I had to take them all out and do it over again. And again. Some issues still couldn't be fixed, however. I found that while type testing, the E key was seriously out of alignment with the rest of the letters when typing. After closer inspection, we realized that the type of the E type slug was broken at one point and then re-soldered on by someone who put too much length on it. I couldn't fix that adjustment, so my E's just type higher than everything else. It's definitely an interesting quirk that shows the work of somebody else that was here before me, just like those wacky green key tops. We'd removed the carriage of this typewriter pretty early on in the process. I also removed the paneling from the carriage in order to repaint it. In order to put this back together, I first reattached all the paneling. Then I placed the carriage back on the typewriter and snapped it into place by tightening these carriage clamps at the back of the machine. In addition, we also attached the draw band to the carriage and had to tighten that up by using the tension of the draw band mainspring, which is done by turning the screw at the back of the drum. While it was attached and I had placed the platen back in the machine, something still didn't feel right and was getting stuck and not carrying to the end of the line. What I had to do was play around with the carriage clamps to get them to properly grip the rail, while also allowing for some places in the center because the lower rails on this machine can be thicker in the center than they actually are on the edges. Learn something new every day. There are also two ball bearings on the rails of this carriage that go in between the lower rail and the upper rail of the machine. Placement on this is really important to keep your carriage from rocking forward and backward. I had them in the wrong place to begin with, so the machine would rock around a lot. I had to loosen the carriage again and put these back into place and make sure that the bearings were in the right location so that the carriage didn't rock while typing. I also adjusted the tension of the mainspring so that the carriage would have enough tension to type to the end of the line without running out of steam. 
Once I had this figured out, I discovered the paper tray really wasn't held in place because I was missing two screws. So I broke out my parts machine to find two tiny screws to hold this in place. And the bell didn't work. I first discovered I was missing a spring that attached the bell arm to the post in the back. So I ordered one online, but it still hasn't shown up. So I broke out my parts machine again and found a spring that would fit. It still wasn't working. It turns out the little arm on the bottom of this margin set wasn't hanging low enough to alert the bell that it was hitting the end of the line. I had to loosen this up because it was just rusted in place, and once that arm hung down, it was in a better place to align with the bell arm, and I finally had a working typewriter bell. Another realization. So the keys on this typewriter are from a KMM, and the actual type slugs are from the Royal Ten itself but they don't exactly match. So if I hit this, what looks like a degree symbol and a half, I get the cent sign. If I hit the at cent sign on the keyboard, I get the, I get nothing because it's stuck. On the commas, I get, I don't know what that is. I get a three fourths. On the half and degree, I get the at symbol, and on the at cent sign, I get a fourth. <laughs> we probably took out some of the pieces of this machine three or four times. I took it apart completely that first time to repaint it. And then as I was putting things back in the typewriter, I didn't know what order they went in to make it all work. So I did have to take out some things a few times. I had to redo the linkages on the keys maybe three times, which every single time I got faster at it, but more frustrated. And the carriage I probably took off half a dozen times. It's just gonna take you a while to do some of those adjustments, especially if you don't know what you're doing, like me. Now in doing that, I still have a bag of parts from this machine, some of which came out and I think probably should have gone back in. I still have all of the keys, and then I also have a few extra pieces that I just, I'm not really sure what they did in the first place, um, but they didn't go back in. And a lot of the projects my dad and I tackle seem to work out that way. Somehow there's always a few extra screws that we don't know where they came from. Let's talk a little bit about some of the lessons I learned while doing this process because I learned a lot. Not only about how those actual internal pieces work, how each piece of linkage actually fits into a typewriter and what it does, but I also learned a lot about the process of restoring and repairing a typewriter. The first thing I learned is that you should definitely do really extreme and detailed thorough testing before you take anything out of your typewriter to know what's wrong with it. There were so many times during the adjustment phase of this process, after we put the machine back together, and we're trying just to make sure that it was adjusted properly, that we were asking ourselves, well, did this work when it came out of the machine? So that we could know if we just did something wrong putting it back in there, or if it didn't work in the first place. And those are things I wish I would have done more thorough testing and more detailed investigation at the beginning of this process. I did a little bit of a diagnosis, but it was not very detailed in how off some of these things were. One example of this would be the bell on the carriage. I had no idea it was missing a spring until like a week before it was finished because I just didn't look there and I didn't know how that worked. After the fact, I was able to look at it and say, oh, I'm missing a piece there, but I didn't know that going into the project. So I wasn't sure if I had done something wrong or if it was like that when I got it. The reason I have it up like this is because of the, the first problem. That wasn't even a problem before I messed that up. Wait, was it above this or under this? Well then it couldn't have been this way then, Sarah. It has to be on the other side. It doesn't have... So you think it might be wrong bracket? I don't know. That doesn't look right to me. So we don't know what that goes on to. But it's on this side of this thing. I don't... That's where it goes. I don't know, because it's hitting that thing. Mm -hmm. Let's see. That was it. That was it? <laughs> you ground down your big screwdriver for like a quarter turn? Yep. Another really important lesson I learned was how to do a proper paint job on a typewriter. This project was done before I did my estate sale pink typewriter video, which I'll link below. But 
When I did this one, I didn't fully remove the paint underneath, and that is something I would totally do now. The original paint, I did sand down to make smooth, but there are just some texture issues in the paint job itself on this typewriter that I kind of painted over, and it doesn't look pristine or perfect. So I'd probably, if I were to redo this, sandblast the original paint off of there, or remove some of that original finish, so that when the new finish goes on, there's no chipping underneath the paint already, and it just has like a nicer, smoother finish to it. In fact, I actually had a decal here on this front panel because there's like a little bit of a weird texture issue there. And as we were doing the adjustments on this typewriter, we kept lifting from the front of the frame and we actually wore off that decal. So I ended up removing it completely, but that was covering up like a really bad texture issue on the front of this typewriter. And now it's a little bit more visible. And if I were to redo it, I would definitely remove all of that paint beforehand. Another thing I learned was that you need to walk away sometimes, but it's also important to know when to go back to the project. I'm one of those people that uh, has a little bit of a perfectionist streak. I don't know if you can tell, but when I start a project, I really want it to be perfect by the time I finish it. And if it doesn't go the way I planned it, I can get really easily frustrated. And this project is a very good illustration of that because it took me a year to get here and it's still not perfect. And I have to kind of sit here and go, but I've done my best and it's working and that's all I can do for now. But what I really learned about this process is sometimes you just have to walk away and you can't be in it every single day because you just won't be able to see things clearly because you'll be so emotional about it, or at least I will. And as I was able to walk away and then come back to this machine, I was able to look at it with a little bit of a different perspective, a little bit of a clearer head and figure out what to do next on this machine and kind of remove the emotional tie out of that process. I also learned though, however, it's really important to go back to something. If you're afraid of it, if you're scared of it, and I'm a scaredy cat, you kind of have to just force yourself to go back to the project even when you're not sure what to do next. Because if you walk away from it for a really long time, you're gonna forget how some of those pieces work. Right now, a year later, I couldn't tell you how to do some of the things on this typewriter that I actually did in this process. I can't exactly remember how I did some of those things putting the keys back in there, even though I did it and I filmed the whole thing. But if you walk away from a really long period of time from a project, it's possible that you'll forget how those things work. So make sure that the time you spend in between parts of your project, you don't elongate it too long, like a year or six months, so that when you go back to your project, you still know how things work, but you've spent enough time away from it to look at it from a different perspective. And that's a little bit more on the emotional side of typewriter repair. And maybe you don't get emotional about typewriter repair, and that's a me problem, but that was definitely a huge factor in this project for me. I cried so many times. It was such a long, frustrating process. And now that it's over, I feel such relief. But that's a little bit of how I approach this project. I wanted it to be perfect when it was done. I've come to learn that not everything is going to be perfect add to the factory when you're doing repairs on it. In fact, some of these pieces are being held together by paper clips right now. Like it's not a factory restoration, but it's good enough. It's good enough because it's saving the typewriter. And that was the whole goal from the very beginning of this process. And I did achieve that. So this typewriter is from 1932. And I did ask in the first video for some name suggestions for this typewriter. So here are a few that were commented on the original video in this series. Someone suggested Sir Inkingham, okay. Gus, Lilibet, Duke, Miss Daisy, Bonnie Prince, Charles Stewart, that's a little bit long. And someone also suggested Windsor for Windsor Castle. So I decided to name this typewriter Monster. And I mean it affectionately. When I first got this typewriter, the first thing I thought of was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I thought about how this typewriter was going to have keys from something else, springs from a different typewriter, how I used my parts typewriter to put it back together. It is not at all originally a Royal 10. And as we were doing the repair process on this, we found a lot of pieces in here that were just kind of adapted poorly by somebody else who was here before me. And it made me really think about Frankenstein's monster. So I was thinking about what I was going to name it, characters from that book, and I realized that Frankenstein is the name of the doctor and his creation doesn't actually have a name besides Frankenstein's monster. And I'm working on my PhD and someday I'll have it done. So someday I'll be Dr. Everett and this will be my monster. So 
that's the process. That's the whole series on buying a bad typewriter, taking it from start to finish. I can't believe we finished this. If you're interested in seeing the rest of this series, I've linked a playlist down below of the Buying a Bad Typewriter series. I've got all of the videos and each step of the process in a short little video clip, which you can watch in that playlist, which I've linked below. I also made a sticker to go along with this series and I've released it on my Redbubble store, which I've linked down in the description below. It is a picture of the original bad typewriter and I have turned that into a sticker so you can have your own bad typewriter. So feel free to pick one of those up. If you're interested in other typewriter content, I have some other videos on this YouTube channel related to some smaller projects in my collection. I also have an Instagram at just.my.typewriter. I want to thank you so much for joining me on this arduous, lengthy, frustrating, but interesting and educational journey of buying a bad typewriter, taking it from start to finish. I also want to thank you so much for joining me here on this channel today, and I want to remind you that you're just my type writer.